so good morning and welcome to the session. Um, we'll start with uh, our audience with the uh, first talk from Simula, identifying the parameters of the market. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And I'd also like to thank the uh, organizers for giving the opportunity to speak here as online. Uh, I'd also like to congratulate the organizers on this perfect turnout, what seems to be a great event. So I'm going to talk about some of our work on uh, data simulation of the complex cardiac mechanics and the QC dolphin with joint. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is primarily going to look, I would say, of my uh, student, Gabriel Wallabon, and my colleague, Mark in office. And I guess that a lot of you can tell which part are primarily Gabriel's and which are primarily Mark's contributions. Um, also, since I have quite a bit of time, I thought I'd try to adopt this to the audience in the sense that I'll be giving some introductions and then I'll present a couple of scientific studies. And hopefully, there will be some people who are ever want a bit of math, a bit of code, and a bit of actual study. So, with that, let me start by showing you a video. So, what is this? see the left, uh, the right ventricle, uh, and the floppy thing is one of the heart valves opening and closing during the cardiac cycle. So these are the type of data that we have to work with, and essentially what we'd like to do is to create a model of something like this that we can use for prediction. So that and I'm going to give a quick outline to cardiac mechanics. We're trying to use, or well, we are using, uh, being a constrained optimization um, to calibrate our models to data, the primary chemistry of these studies. Um, so I'll give an introduction to the constrained optimization, and then I'll talk about three more scientific aspects, namely that uh, these cardiac mechanics problems give rise to variational forms that are of a certain complexity that makes handling them challenging. And I'll present the results from two studies, namely one with the passive hypoelastic material parameters of the heart. What essentially what is the stiffness of the heart, uh, and um, I work on both passive and active parameter estimation for uh, something called cardiac reconstitution theory. Okay, let me start with the introduction to cardiac mechanics. So the heart is a uh, muscle, and it's composed of muscle tissue with fibers, uh, and it undergoes large deformations. Well, and it's considered to be as an engineering process. Uh, so based on this, it's natural to model cardiac tissue in your area, disregarding all that has to do with this electrophysiology, that is electrical activity in the heart, which I'm going to do, but you model cardiac tissue as a hyperplastic area. So what you're interested in solving for is uh, the difference is phase 17, which is the And you're interested in finding the U that minimizes the certain energy and the strain in to nothing, but it's given by uh, the interval over the domain in Columbia. And some strain energy that's the psi, which is a function of this displacement Q, and then the body, uh, body forces in the okay. In addition, we're assuming a compressibility which gives you a constraint on the volume of these uh, of the heart, and it gives you a constraint on the type of deformations that the heart can undergo. So this constraint would be step F equals one or F. The gradient deformation. So the displacement u is related to the deformation x uh, by x is u plus the identity mapping. And so the gradient of deformation f is the gradient of u plus the identity. Uh, I'll denote sometimes that f and sometimes j will denote that. But essentially, the constraining compressibility says that uh, the determinant of the deformation gradient should be equal to. <coughs> we have a question in the back. Where's the time? Considering a uh, static uh, set. So you're considering a quasi static uh, approximation, you're ignoring, we're ignoring all SRA 
integration terms. So we won't be looking at any waves propagating through the heart tissue, but we'll look at the force study in the sense that the body force will vary. So it's just the instantaneous It's an instantaneous Now the fun part here is what does this psi look like? So this is the psi, is the strain energy density. That is a mean value function of the displacement u. And we're interested in using um, the so-called whole sample of the uh, strain energy density. It's a function of eight material parameters. The material parameters are the delta m, and they're essentially stiffnesses in various directions. It's an orthotropic strain energy density. Does anyone know what orthotropic is? <coughs> John? Well, it's top thing is dependent on the direction. So it's uh, orthotropic is essentially, it's not isotropic, so it doesn't mean it's, it's not the same in all directions. Uh, in particular, it depends on, how it depends on three different directions. The so muscle tissue is composed of fibers, so we have a direction, and the fibers are more or less aligned, basically. We have a direction that describes the direction of the fibers. The direction of the fibers are organized in sheets. So we have a direction finding the uh, fiber and the sheet plane. And then we have the third direction, which is the sheet fiber normal direction. So that every point in your heart is essentially defines the local coordinate system defined by the fiber direction and the sheet directions. So we'll have, uh, so this parameter is AF and BF will be associated with the fiber direction, AS and BS will be associated with the sheet direction, and AFS and BFS will be associated with this fiber sheet normal direction. Now the strain energy density, which is defined by the whole supplement of the model, is given by the sum of these four terms. So gamma is something that relates to the material parameters in this form here. Essentially, a divided by 2b for the different material parameters. Uh, e is the exponential function, so it will be a sum of various exponentials, and here we'll have the i1, i41, and i, sorry for i, and i AFS. These are invariants of the so called um, volume weight of rainbow sheet strain, strain tensor, that's c. So I1 will be, so C is given by this expression here, so it will be the determinant of F to the power to third time F transpose F, so it will be a tensor. And remember that U comes into F here. So U comes in here, gets multiplied a couple of times. You take the trace of it, or you take certain components of it. Here, E, F, E, S, and EFS defines the spaces for the local coordinate system. Um, and then you take an exponent of H is here, a have a side function, or a side function. Okay? Um, sorry? You said before it's incompressible, so yes. Jay's Series of learning experiments. 
So F here will either quasi um, depend on time or actually depend on time. So we'll have a series of these non-linear virtual problems. They will depend on some form of time, but they will not, will not be any time. Okay, so that's the one-on-one on finding the counts. Let me move on to say something about the constraint of the So we were interested in calling calibrating essentially these material properties in this finding mechanics model to some observations. And we'll do so. Uh, by considering uh, a gradient-based optimization approach, and we'll look at this as a PD constraint optimization. So we have some kind of functional J. Uh, that's a function of the parameters or the control M. Think of that as the material parameters in the previous, uh, and the state or in the solution U. So we think of that as U P from the previous. In addition to minimizing this uh, functional, we have a constraint. We have a PD constraint which relates the control M to the state U denoted here F. So, just to give an example which is relevant, so for instance, J could be that you would add some observations for you and you'd like to minimize the um, L to of your state and these observations in the design domain plus some kind of regularization factor for controlling the control M. That's what this example here is. So this is an example of the functional. And an example of the constraint is, for instance, this above bottom here, where the control vector is as a one of those. So, one approach uh, for doing this is the so called one shot approach. That's, we're not using this approach, I'll be very quick, but I just wanted to mention it. Is that if you define the Lagrangian, so the L is the Lagrangian. Minus the sum of the functional and the constraint, and then multiply the sum of the branch multiplier. Um, and you take all of the variations with respect to all of the variables of this Lagrangian. So you get a couple system in the state, the control variable, and a design variable. Um, for uh, non linear time dependent problems, uh, my experience so far is that this is an impractical approach. Uh, but I understand that the jury is out on this in the PD constraint optimization environment. So I wouldn't say too much uh, about it. I would just say that this, this is an approach we're not using. What we are using is that we're using the so called reduced functional approach, which is based on uh, using some optimization algorithm where you iteratively solve for the state uh, and incrementally changing uh, the control and hopefully converting. So what's the formalities for this? So I think of F, the P as a way of computing U given F, a way of computing the state given the parameters. This is not the funny, this is the way we usually think about solving PDs and solving the problem. This defines U as an implicit function of M. Now I define the reduced functional R, R, which is a function of M all the as J uh, of U evaluated by M and M. So it has been very explicit about the dependence of M. And the minimizes of this, keeping in mind here that U is related to M through F, uh, will be the, the minimizes uh, of that. Okay. And if we have a functional, or we have some kind of function, and like to minimize it, we take the basis where the divergence is zero. Assuming that it does have a minimum, that there's no constraints, and so on and so on. So, um, we want to use a gradient based optimization algorithm for solving this um, optimization problem. We rely on the functional gradient, so that is the derivative or the total derivative of R with respect to M. When I said it's zero, and all optimization algorithms, or many efficient optimization algorithms, are based on computing this gradient uh, and then trying to find it. The question becomes how do you compute this total derivative of R with respect to M? So by using the implicit function derivative, that's essentially the general, um, we see that the derivative of R with respect to M is the derivative of J with respect to U, and the partial derivative of U with respect to M. Uh, and then in addition, uh, you get the partial derivative of J with respect to M. So the derivatives of J with respect to U and M with respect to M are, are easy, because we're, essentially we have an explicit formula for J, which is So if you're 
remember here, for instance, in our example, this is J, and differentiating this with respect to U or with respect to M is just differentiating this exponential. Oh, this red right here. Watch the derivative of U with respect to M is not so easy to compute because we don't have an implicit relation between us and the given part. So one way of efficiently computing this is via the, the so-called adjective. Um, and the idea is that you define the adjoint equation, which is related to a full equation, and you define the adjoint solution as a solution of the full adjoint equation. Okay, so the adjoint equation is this. So it's the partial of the PDEF, partial derivative of f for respect to u, and then take the, the adjoint. Uh, lambda is here the adjoint solution, and on the right hand side we have the partial derivative of the Okay, so note that this adjoint solution depends on the forward problem and it also evaluated at the forward solution and the function of the knot on the um, parameter m other than through m. So by introducing this and by doing some homogeneity of the equations you'll get an equivalent formula for computing this functional gradient. So the derivative of r with respect to m will be the adjoint solution times the partial derivative of the f with respect to m and the partial derivative Okay, so the advantage of this is that this adjoint equation is linear. If, even if your forward problem is, is nonlinear, the adjoint equation will be linear. Uh, it's of the same dimensions as your original system, and its size is independent. So in the case where you have many parameters, and you have a parameters, especially varying parameters, this will be a big advantage. And this is the approach that we're using. So now for the uh, more computer science oriented part of this talk. I'm going to claim that some of my equations are quite mechanical also challenging. Uh, and we'll look at why this is interesting and what we've done to fix it. So part of the motivation here is, is uh, the part that involves a dominant job. So dominant job is an interesting extension. But given a forward model of being the meanings, automatically derives that an equation and solves them. It does so by doing quite a bit of form manipulation. So assume that you have some large, possibly time dependent, possibly nonlinear, possibly doing something else, uh, forward model breaking into the meanings. And you do a number of uh, solves at a time. Uh, and then dolphin and joint will annotate and keep track of what happens happening in the forward model. And then it will be running a number of form manipulations, such as taking derivative forms, uh, taking actions, taking doing replaces, and so on on the forms. Okay. In general, when you build abstractions on top of the things, uh, you'll be doing a lot of these form manipulations, and then you're relying on So, uh, Gabriel then, very enthusiastically, said, going, I imagine that this would be just right on the forward model, but it would often join a year ago uh, to uh, yes, go. And uh, he quickly came to the, so this was using a EP tool as well, um, and he, he quickly started running into some uh, runtime bottlenecks. So, let me just tell you something about what this. Uh, these timings and numbers are for. So this is with the FFT and PM concrete for so the quadrature representation. Uh, I reduce the quadrature degree to four. Uh, it's a single solve of this uh, old sapper model, um, and I've limited the number of Newton equations to one. So essentially, it will do um, two or three residual evaluations uh, and one evaluation of the derivative. One evaluation of R and one evaluation of R. Three evaluations of R and one evaluation of DR, the derivative uh, of R. This is on a very big mesh. It's a one by one by one unit cube. It's got six cells and it's P2P1 Teller code, so it's got 
eight by eight by nine elements for the so I'm gonna solve that using a direct linear solver. Uh, the anisotropy directions and also polynomial is E F E S and E F S that implies the basis is constant throughout the entire material. This is not realistic, but it's a simplification. Um, and I think that's about it. Uh, I was unable to compile this with turning on efficacy optimizations. Uh, we just like ran out of memory uh, on everything I tried. Uh, so please don't, but this quite is your representation. I don't think it ever was optimized for that uh, turning the optimizations on. So please don't take the numbers for the quadrature as very representative, but it illustrates to us some of the practical uh, scenarios here. So I've got two rows here, assemble row sigil, timings in seconds, and assemble the, uh, the by data flow. The first row is with JIT, and the second row is uh, the, uh, a repeated row. And what you see is that uh, you just, okay, just compiling and assembling the residual it takes about 10 to 15 seconds, uh, which is not too bad if you're doing it once. Assembly is quick. Uh, but as compiling this, uh, the binding at home, the derivative takes about 80 seconds. Uh, and if you're doing something, and assembling it takes once, actually, uh, it takes 8 seconds. And once you're trying to do this a number of times, this starts getting rather uh, tiresome, I'd say. And the worst part was that we were observing that Dolphin and joint seemed to be not this, um, it was not catching up. It was introducing an overhead that was scaling with the number that was not uh, scaling as expected uh, with the number of radio souls, but rather at a higher rate. So we're looking more into this, and we're looking at if you're disregarding a sample, but just looking at tits, uh, we can look at the tit times for these forms. So it's the same, this table gives the same um, two rows in the sense that not, I'm not timing assembling, I'm just timing JIT for the residual and its derivative in a second. So the JIT of this takes about all the time, so that in seconds, this takes about 70 seconds. Now the second run, so it, there's a first run, a second run um, in the same program, and the program essentially run once again. Um, and you can extract the form memory, if you run JIT again, and it won't go in memory, it takes essentially no time. But here's a, here's a surprisingly really large number, so this is one and a half second for maybe finding the form uh, from the distance. And, and this is not bad, and this is what this was accumulating uh, a number of times in the the joint that was accumulating for every initial revealing to uh, clearly suboptimal forms. Okay, so in Phoenix 1.4, computing, um, finding a form in the dip cache, you rely on computing the form signature. And in Phoenix 1.4, computing the form signature uh, for forms that involve some kind of different differentiation involve um, computing, uh, applying the automatic differentiation And this is essentially what takes a lot of time for some of these complicated things. So, in uh, that, you can guess who fixed this. So, thanks to Martin, uh, uh, in Phoenix 1.5 and all, I think I'll be hearing correct. Uh, the signature is computed prior to performing uh, automatic differentiation. Uh, this, this, in, this sounds uh, so it, is it only moving a functional call in front of one another? It was a bit more uh, involved in that because uh, if you have a form uh, that uh, you call the derivative of something, and you have to say some coefficients in that form, uh, if you take the derivative, some of the coefficients may cancel. And uh, in the Phoenix machinery, restricting coefficients to cells and using them in assemblies is a costly process. You don't want to do that. You don't want to waste that for coefficients you're not using. Uh, so essentially this involves some refactor of adding information to you uh, about which coefficients are used and which intervals uh, so that this could not be able to be uh, looked up to find uh, by the same Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Martin also did a number of or kind of detailed profiling, trying to reduce the overhead in EUFL as much as possible. Um, the most significant was the change in EUFL traversal algorithms uh, for these so-called transformers, these multi-function uh, algorithms, which is based on moving from a, a recursive type of implementation to a non-recursive type of implementation, which according to Martin, it accounts for about a hundred times speed up. Also, he's added, um, there's been quite a detailed amount of profiling here, and, and just to illustrate, um, in particular, we've added new kind of type traits, uh, such as having an explicit type in a UFL as terminal in order to avoid this instance uh, terminal. This is quite on the detail level. Um, but the fact is that we get significant performance improvements. These were observing what was a bottleneck before was no longer a bottleneck. So these are just the numbers I showed you before from Phoenix 1.4. There shouldn't be a minus there, it should be just Phoenix 1.4. Uh, and in particular, you have these, the JIT took about 13, here we have about 70, and these numbers here are really the problematic ones. In Phoenix uh, 1.6, SMP Phoenix from three days ago, now you can see that. Uh, or 6.6 .6 minus is what I call this, almost 1.6. Uh, the JIT time is reduced by about a factor of 30%, uh, or maybe 50%, so going from 70 here to 40 here, which is definitely noticeable. We don't see any difference in the JIT from our cache, because we shouldn't. Uh, but the JIT from the, the disk cache, you see that these numbers, which started accumulating before, uh, are now reduced to the no. good In addition to this, um, UFlex, the UFlex from the competitor, is continuously maturing. Um, and it's still our only uh, essentially go to solution for these type of problems. You can see why. So here I have on the top is a table for assembling the residual, on the bottom a table for assembling the derivative of the residual. Uh, the rows are three runs, run once, uh, run twice, run three times, uh, timing. These are timings and seconds, comparing the quality representation. No, this is unoptimized, so don't take, uh, don't pay too much attention to his numbers. And here's the U-flex. Uh, so you can see that in this case, compile time is about the same. Uh, run time is significantly lower. In this case, compile time is also significantly lower. Uh, and here, uh, these numbers we really see the difference. So uh, I think yeah, I'm not the right one to ask you even on that. I'm sure that Doc can tell you a bit more about uh, the quadrature uh, representation. But I think that it's just, it was not really designed to scale to this complicated form of the implementation of other I think the main take home message is for complicated forms, you see graphs, you do. Okay, so if I move on to the two um, kind of more science, what are we actually using this for? I have the science aspects here, and the first thing I talk about, what I want to talk about is I study on uh, trying to identify what are the passive material properties of the heart. Uh, because we don't really know. What we're using is what exists of uh, well, some of what exists in experimental data. This is based on experiments by Sir Francis Jokic and his colleagues in the Oxford Hawkins, 2002. Uh, and they have a lab and they took, essentially, they had six pigs and they took that tissue from the hearts of each of these six pigs. And so you get a small cube, a three by three cube of pig heart tissue. They put it on a plate, glue it to their the plate on the top, uh, and essentially uh, kind of push it. Uh, incrementally, so you can think of it as time or you can think of it as loading, so push it a bit more, 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 and so on and so forth. And they align this cube, remember that the cube has a fiber direction, it has a sheet direction, and a, uh, a normal direction. And they make sure to align this cube uh, so that they knew which direction was switched and then tested and it just six different directions. So that's 
what's illustrated in this picture here. So this data gives us, so we have six sets of data, six sets corresponding to six states, of so called stress strain curves. So you have known how much strain have you applied and what is the resulting stress. And what the measurements are is that it's the average traction of the average stress on the top of it. Uh, under these different loading scenarios, so the curves here on the x-axis, both of the curves is uh, the strain uh, displacement, or it's the strain, and on the on the y-axis is the stress. Uh, and the, there's different colors. You don't need to look very clearly at them. Correspond to these different configurations. The test in the different directions. Okay. This is peak number two. This is peak number six. As you can see, the peaks are different. Not all things are created equal. Um, Pig so number two seems to display more of an orthotropic behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see that, you may ask? Well, you'll see that by these here. There is um, there are six curves, but two of them are closer. They're kind of coupled together. There's two more isotropic. Here you only see, in a way, essentially two different directions. Uh, so both more transverse and isotropic. So these are the days we, we have to work with. And we'd like to try to find a material practice that applies to these data. So our objective functional, now we're calling back to the constraint optimization, is that we'd like to find the difference between the modeled uh, average traction over the top face, that's this plot here, TIJ, uh, and the observations, uh, where you have this throughout time, a, a series of loadings. And we like to take the, uh, I would say, the, the integral over time. But we're not actually doing the, the integral, we're only doing uh, by a set of house points. Uh, and I do not think house points here by xk and the weights uh, omega k. And we're also summing over all of these different uh, scenarios, <coughs> uh, sharing scenarios in the different directions. So uh, the ij here is a sum over. So this is a domestic six, and this is essentially 17 gauss points. Um, so this is what we want to minimize, and we'll have a series of uh, six sets of static um, version problems here. And this is what we have for the, for the average fraction. Here P is the, there should be a dot M here, uh, depending on how you define P, of course, but if you think of it as the field of stress that Uh, okay, so uh, we started by just doing essentially the, the standard thing to do the inverse prime thing. Uh, yes, and we set of material parameters, uh, find the resulting observations, and make sure that we can match those. We can do that pretty easily. Uh, and then the next thing was to use this actual data um, to have the actual uh, setup in order to try to find improved versions of material parameters. We started with the material parameters that previously existed in the literature. These material parameters are actually based on the same data set, but it's, it's acknowledged, I think, in the field that they are, the material parameters are no good. Uh, probably. So, what we started, we started with a given, um, I think it's these uh, parameters here, and then we did um, a series uh, of experiments here, and is the mesh size. So we started with just running the essentially a homogeneous information, which does not satisfy your uh, finite element model, but just uh, for the sake of it. And then run an optimization of that, increase the mesh size, uh, run the optimization, and so on and so forth, until well, the, and the idea was that hopefully you'll see some kind of uh, convergence to some material parameters, and that we do. And we did the same for both Big 6 uh, and Big 12, and essentially I think it will stop and you didn't see any more of a variation here. So what I can say about these new material parameters is that they... Um, <coughs> so as we saw uh, on the shift uh, strain plots, the pigs um, display different stress strain behavior, and you'll also see this in this plot, in particular these 
Uh, in general, the BS parameter is always zero. Think about that one for a second. That's a good sign, I think. And um, we also, in this pick here, you see that uh, it tends to zero this A0 as well. Of course, this is zero by zero one is a bound that we've set, but by reducing the bound, it just keeps going to zero. So essentially, there is no uh, issue directions. Um, of course, these from the different pigs, uh, it varies a bit, but there's some of the, it varies quite a lot, I would say, but there's, uh, I think they're not completely in assessment, so some of the parameters are, are more similar than others. So, the, one of the challenges here, uh, maybe, whether well, it's an optimal challenge, I think it's that we have not very much data. Uh, and what the data we have is average, so this is Many, many uh, And we were wondering how we're just hitting some random local uh, minima. And is this uh, procedure robust? So, what we tried was to do kind of multi start optimization. Essentially, we started with a bunch uh, of uh, various initial gases and an optimization procedure. What I've shown here is, is uh, peak 6 and peak 2. Uh, the best result from this uh, mesh, new mesh, new mesh uh, refining study and with a method from the random. Uh, and there's a relatively decent match between the two, mainly more so in the peak 2 peak 6. So we have a set of robustness. Um, so, just to conclude um, with this study, it's like we presented new material graph about this, where it's all that not being. Uh, looked at before. Uh, what we can see is that the material parameters in the sheet direction seem to be negligible. Uh, so, which is quite a, a, a bit of a complexity reduction for the model. As I mentioned, this is not a lot of data. Uh, there's a number of parameters, a lot of things can happen. So, we have a number, very many local minima, possibly also global minima. And there's always the question that is the big uh, here called. Brings to the purpose how similar are the things to the units. So if you're taking a piece of the heart of the thing and put it out in the lab and you're sharing it, is it really the same as the units? So, um, so that's why one of the reasons why we're looking at actual human data is so one of the so the second study, this is the last thing we're going to talk about, is our study on prognostication for cardiac resynchronization. Uh, this is very much work in progress, so I'm just going to show you some preliminary, preliminary data and uh, the problem set up. So our credit group has a uh, big collaboration building with the uh, Austin University Hospital and GE Ultrasound, which is why we get a lot of ultrasound data, uh, into essentially trying to investigate uh, heart failure and use more things in relation to some of the heart failure. Uh, and one specific uh, application is so-called cardiac resynchronization therapy, which means that you're trying you have patients that have some kind of stroke or something, suffering from some heart failure, their heart may be beating uh, a bit irregularly, so they're not pumping essentially like the uh, optimal pumping function of the heart, but if it's beating irregularly, different bits and pieces may contract to different uh, times and so on, and leading to some optimal beating. So this CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy is a way of making the, the, trying to make the heart beat um, in a way better, more synchronously. Unfortunately, um, about 30% of the patients don't respond to this treatment, or they're responding in a way that's suboptimal. So we try to find a, figure out better ways uh, of predicting what will happen with this treatment. This is, as I mentioned, what we get. Uh, so one of the reasons why we're using ultrasound is because you, ultrasound is super easy to perform uh, and it's very cheap compared to like, uh, other imaging methods such as MR or CRT and it's also, uh, so it's very much easy to use but the cost is that the quality uh, of the data is it's not as good. But what I was going to say here is that this is a so 40 echo or um, like echocardiography, 
and it gives you information about the lab measurable. And based on these images, I'll construct these little patient specific left ventricles and combine it with a synthetic right ventricle for the geometry. You don't have any images of the right ventricle for this. Um, so in the in the Stokes experiments, the previous study, we had five interactions that were aligned with XYZ plane. In a real part, the primary directions of this means so you'll have a uh, we don't know what they are, no one knows what they are, but the primary directions are. So usually what you do is you use so-called uh, rule-based algorithms for generating these ones. We're using the whole of this algorithm model as before, but we're dropping some terms. I am particularly we're only considering the transmissive dropping term corresponding to the um, AF and BF and AB. And we're considering, in addition, considering to this model for the passive response of the tissue, also using the so called active strain framework to model the active contraction of the heart. Uh, and this is modeled using a single front to gamma, which depends on time. Uh, and we're decomposing the as information we're using the basic part and the active part. This gamma that will depend on time or through this cardiac cycle, but it should also ideally depend on space in the sense that we have data from 17 regions of the heart. Uh, they're commonly visualized in this so called bullseye plot, and I've, I've mapped them onto our geometry here. So this is one region, this is one region, here's one region, and so on and so forth. So ideally, that gamma should depend on time and the spatial regions. What we get is that we get data for the strain measurements in certain, for certain components of the strain in a coordinate system given by the ultrasound device and corresponding to the 17 regions of the heart. We get volumes of the heart, amazing, and we get pressure estimates, not from the images because of, but because of additional uh, pressure measurements. This, uh, on this axis, you have strain, volume, pressure on the y-axis, and there's time on the x-axis. This is essentially one heart cycle, this is one heart cycle, this is ten heart cycles. And we get a lot more rapidly, um, I think, uh, sample pressure data for the whole thing. Give you. So what we do then, is to make sure that our pressure and our uh, volume data uh, are at a different, uh, actually from the different, uh, different test case, what we do is we match uh, the pressure and the volume data in order to create these so-called patient-specific PD loops. PD loops are pressure volume loops. You'll see an example here. So here you have volume on the x-axis and the pressure on the y-axis. Essentially, what happens is that the, um, the volume fills, it starts here, it fills, it increases in volume, uh, and then dramatic increase in pressure, leading to the contraction of the heart, volume reduces, and then it relaxes again. Now, this, as far as I understood, these P loops, this is so called the great diagnostic tool for the doctors. They can read quite a bit. A lot of validation just by looking at this key So what we'd like to do is to so having modeled or simulated PV loops uh, is something they would like as a diagnostic tool. We have split this problem in two and that we're using different parts of the cycle to estimate the different parameters. We're gonna take from this, take some points from this lower part here where your the volume is just passively increasing to estimate the passive material on the parameters, and then we use the other data to estimate the transfer parameter gamma. Uh, and our uh, objective is to match the observed strains and the volume. So this uh, is the and we'll, we'll label the two by a parameter alpha. So alpha equals to 
zero will lead to only extreme optimization, alpha equals to one will lead to only volume optimization, alpha sub lambda will lead to two. The strength misfit is given by the CV here, so the uh, epsilon D observation, D observation is our observation, so the strain in the direction D. Uh, here are the corresponding modeled uh, quantity. Uh, we have a, a trust factor, essentially say something, how much do we trust this observation? Um, the D is sum over the direction, so the ultrasound for the um, coordinate system. Uh, the other sum is over the, the loop point, so essentially here is sum over time, and here is the sum over the spatial regions. Similarly, the volume misfit is given by we'd like to uh, match the volume given. Uh, by the model to that set volume. Five minutes, or? And you're already standing? I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. Okay, I'll, I'll, fin I'll finish in three. Um, our correction, we don't use fast correction measurements. Um, and when it's said, we're using them directly as that. So these are their cells that we're passive. Material phase. Uh, this is something that you know. Top line is our initial uh, values result from the previous, just from the data from the previous study. There's alpha, um, as you can see, at the zero, we seem to be hitting a bound, which is 100 on this parameter here. Um, the other parameter is uh, almost constant, probably because they're dominating because they're so high, uh, but in this high uh, regime, seems pretty constant. So we have a hope of getting some more or less generic parameter values out of this. Um, for the contraction parameter, this is, I would say is, is work in progress. Our current uh, results just use a constant gamma to match the volumes. Uh, and the, I'm just going to show you this very small video of the heart contracting in this phase. So this is just part of the contraction phase for the gamma. And the resulting gamma for that, and we'll working on extending this to spatially varying uh, contraction factors. And that's it. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, are there any questions? It might very well be that there's uh, some of the interferences that end up uh, are not activated in that kind of test. Uh, yeah, I think we yeah, look at it as a sensitivity or should have done that. If you go to the sensitivity, it's like a problem. Yeah, I can do it. Anyone else can find any complicated forms? <laughs> Some of the algorithms in UFLAX um, the other day to see how to form the equivalent of a sort of microelastic model. Yeah. And he had an inverse of the deformation tensor. Uh, so he's kind of trying to recover the initial position of objects. Yeah. And, uh, and so FFC on its own wouldn't be well, but UFLAX would. So we're very pleased. Yeah. 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 saying about the uh, incompressibility constraint, and I think it's on the slide, in the start about uh, nearly incompressible, is that uh, relaxation of some of those constraints is going to be useful, or is that, uh, or are there other constraints that you'd be keen to introduce? I, I, I'm not sure if it's going to be useful, it's going to be like, because uh, I don't think the clinicians care whether you use anything incompressible or nearly incompressible, or any model that you can ask on it. All tissues, no tissues, have to be. Um, but in this case, we can, this 
I'm not quite sure. Uh, I think it's, it's important to look at this in more detail because we're getting, uh, it, it's important to quantify. I don't think it's it's just stalling. I think it's an actual solution. I think it's a lot of, it's, it's conjecture. But um, remember that essentially we, we, we only have some average, you know, we have an average fraction over a phase, right? <coughs> A lot of things that can match. Thank you very much, Marie. Uh, for instance, thank you. Thank you very again. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to start for our next.